Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. For those who don't know me, my name is Ben Barris. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kateria. We're hosting the event today. Uh, and just a note for today, uh, you know, all of our speakers, no one's being paid to be here. Everyone is, is here because they really care about this community. They care about ranching. They care about sustainability in these systems. Uh, people have different opinions on the ways to approach ranching. There's a lot of different things. It's a practice that's been around for thousands of years, but you know, two people will give you three different answers. So, you know, please be respectful of questions. Engage in discussion. If you want to dive into someone deeper, you can meet Matt Rick. It's the parking lot. He'll tell you more. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, please just uh, we, we look forward to the discussion. And, and thanks for joining us. All right, uh, great to be here, Ben. Thanks for the invite. I'm Mark Young. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Land Trust. Uh, before Land Trust, I spent six years leading digital at Bayer Crop Science. So uh, I also am a farm kid. Grew up on a farm. Uh, background in technology, and then uh, have been combining those two passions for about the last 10 years. So, um, it gave me a clicker. There we go. Okay, this uh, this first panel is all about uh, stacked enterprises, and uh, I didn't want to assume things. Sometimes we use terms like these things, and not everybody is on the same page as to what they really mean when we're talking about them. So, okay, uh, so when we talk about stacked enterprises on a farm and ranch. Uh, what are we really talking about? And uh, I found this great sort of breakdown uh, by some folks that have already done it. Uh, and it really comes down to three steps. The first one is examining your fixed costs. And I don't have to tell anyone a lot about this one. There's a certain amount of costs on your operation you're never gonna get away from. But if we can take a look at every single one of those costs and really evaluate it, that's our first step. So is everything really fixed? Is there anything that can be removed or eliminated? And a big one there, and, and we focus on this as a company every day, are there any costs that could be turned around into a profit, right? These are things like, I know a lot of row crop guys that to cover their equipment note, they actually farm as a service. So they'll do their own ground, they'll also run that equipment on somebody else's ground, and all that additional stuff covers all that note on the equipment. So that takes a cost that is coming out of your bottom line, unavoidable, right? You, you can't farm without equipment, but that takes that cost and turns it in either to a neutral or a positive for their operation. And that's always the first step. Go through all your costs see which ones are absolutely must-haves, be creative, is there anything that can be taken from a cost center and either turn it into a neutral or a positive. The second one is around increasing profits, and this doesn't mean increasing production. Um, I know it's a, it's a trap we all fall into, right? We either want to run more head or we want more acres or we want more rotations. That is always the easiest thing for us to think about when it comes to increasing profit, but that's not always the place where it's easy to find, right? Those increasing production always comes with additional caveats. But how do we increase profit? Are the ways to increase the margin per unit? What are we doing on our input costs? Is there ways to lower those? Um, are there ways to command a higher price? You know, on the ranching side, I know folks that just run, you know, Herefords and Angus, and then I know folks that run high-end specialty breeds that are getting unbelievable prices per head uh, for some of the genetics on these on these uh, livestock, right? Um, and so that second one is about optimizing your profit per unit. It's not about increasing head, it's not about increasing acres, it's really looking at line by line about are we getting the most profit out of how we're operating? And then the third one is really about the talk and what the rest of us here on the panel are gonna talk about today, but it comes after these first two steps. If you jump right to number three without going through numbers one and number two, you're doing yourself a disservice. But number three is about how do we stack more enterprises on that acre? What this comes down to is what else can be added to or optimized on the land that we already have? And this is where things really start to get interesting. It's, it's not always in our comfort zone, um, but it really can make a big difference to the bottom line. And I, and I put a little bit uh, of some examples over here on the right. So, uh, you know, from a livestock 
uh, perspective, yes, we run cows, but what about pigs? What about sheep? What about chickens? I know folks that, that run a cattle operation and then have free range chickens uh, and can market and sell those chickens as an added revenue stream for the ranch. I know ranchers that breed their healers and sell cattle dogs at, as a, at quite a good profit margin as an additional revenue stream on the ranch. Here's another thing that's a cost center, right? You gotta have dogs if you're running cows in general. Uh, they're, they're cheaper. How's that going? A good dog is worth three in the saddle, right? Um, but a lot of guys don't think about that, but if you have really good cattle dogs, breeding those cattle dogs for other, other ranchers is a really good revenue stream. I put the flowers, pollinators, bees, and honey over there. What if you were to get a grant to put in pollinator habitat, which are pretty readily available, and based on that pollinator habitat, you bring in bees and have honey as an additional revenue stream. You don't even have to deal with the bees yourself. There's lots of beekeepers that will come in with the hive and uh, and work with you to, to, to deliver honey, right? It's just, you already have the ground. There's ways to stack these things in interesting ways. You know, grain, hay, uh, cover crops, timber. You know, you're already out there doing, uh, doing grains. What if you put in uh, sorghum, not even to harvest, put it in as a cover, as an overwinter for pheasants, right? These things stack, and then we'll get to, get to pheasants and things in a minute, but equipment, hauling system, uh, services, marketing. I know ranches that actually have a completely separate marketing business. The marketing business actually buys the cattle from the ranch, and then they operate that differently, right? It's, it's really about thinking creatively about all the different ways that your operation can stack different value propositions, and it all adds up to a better bottom line at the end of the day. Uh, water, water, water management is always a big thing. Obviously, probably some of us out here from Eastern Montana today. Uh, luckily, it's been better this year, but it's been incredibly dry the past couple years. Everything has come down to water management, uh, aside from the grasshoppers as well. Uh, it got cut off of the slide there, but there's ponds and fish I put under there. Um, and then on the right, this is where Land Trust, the company that I work at today, really focuses, and it's on sort of the recreation aspect of the ground. So you've got the ground, you're already working it, you're paying for it. What are all the different activities that folks would love to come out and experience on their ground? Camping, RVing, hiking, hunting, fishing, foraging. We've had people book ranches to set up their telescope to look at the stars. Why? Because ranches are incredibly nice. <laughs> they're far away from town by definition, generally speaking, and they're great places to stargaze. We've had folks book foraging for morels that come up in the spring. We've had folks book shed hunting. We've had folks book everything, hiking, biking, you name it. And it's, and it's ways to stack an additional revenue stream onto the farm and the ranch that makes you more profitable, that keeps you on the ground, it makes it viable for the next generation. This is what stacked enterprises are all about. And I'll wrap up, uh, we'll see if this uh, AV works. I hate talking about land trust. I love it when our ranchers talk about land trust. And so we've got a little video that the uh, Farm Journal put together for us from one of our ranches up in Big Sandy. Paw Mountains. Snow falls with purpose across John Sh Winter in the foothills of the Bear Paw Mountains. Snow falls with purpose across John Sheehy's ranch, east of Big Sandy, Montana. When we call Montana Big Sky Country, and, and when you're up here, you can, you can see the Big Sky. Oh, that you know, I have both our, our deeded place and I lease some private town, too, and, and on that we're running just over 400 head of the mother cows, and then you have the, you know, the heifers, the yearlings, and the, the uh, bulls and such that go along with that. So, so we got just over 450 head of livestock on the place right now that we're raising. It's a labor of love for this fifth generation producer, started by his great great grandfather in 1900. He came out to Montana chasing gold. Uh, he came out here and, and he never found a lot of gold, but he found a pretty smart wife. They were living out of Great Falls, and he was saving money to head up north to the Klondike, and his 
wife said, uh, we're not doing that, and had a little more sense than him, and they bought this place in 1900. As he works to protect these views for the sixth generation, John has found a partner in Land Trust, an online booking service that connects farmers and ranchers with folks who love the outdoors. We've been with Land Trust, I think, about 10 months, and so far it's been a really excellent experience. Predominantly, we work with uh, you know multi-generation farm and ranch families like you know, the sheep use here. Um, although we do have other types of landowners that are on land trust, but you know, we, we talk to them, they understand they have this incredible resource, they feel very privileged to have it. And as you hear from, from folks like John, they want to share it with people. We really view them as our partner, um, making sure they're happy, right? So setting them up for success, making sure you know they're achieving their goals that fit their operation. Because every operation is, is unique in its own you know, awesome way. For John and his ranching operation, the flexibility to offer hunting and outdoor experiences on his timeline was important. One nice thing about it is there's you know, no big long-term commitment or contract. If you get started and you decide it's not for you or not working right, uh, you, you can have a conversation with them and pull your listing and, and go back to doing what you're doing. But it's certainly been a, a positive experience for us so far. Well, this little guy he's got this morning, but... And for the hunters enjoying their time on the Sheehy Ranch. We drew the tags first, and then we scrolled them through social media and saw an ad for Land Trust, and uh, clicked on it the first time and started searching for properties, and just the pictures alone on John's property made me want to come out here. It was super easy to, to book through Land Trust, and the Land Trust was really easy to work with, and John was great as far as communication and getting, getting back to me right away. After multiple days and a successful hunt, the memories will last a lifetime. Hitting the deer was going to be a bonus. It was just about you know being out here with my dad and enjoying enjoying the beautiful scenery for a few days and hiking around and putting some miles on our boots and, and we did that for sure and, and had a great time. It's kind of surreal to you know hear folks uh, like John talk about man trust and the experiences that he's had with it and his family, but also getting to meet you know sportsmen who literally just came out of the field. We weren't planning on that. It was just a nice serendipitous thing. But to see a father and son uh, come out, enjoy it. They got great deer and that was awesome. But, uh, you know, they were here for the experience. So anytime I can see, you know, a father, son or father, daughter, a family dynamic uh, getting out and making memories. I mean, that's what back in 2019 when, when Nick and I chatted and first met, that's kind of the vision I saw with Land Trust was that the potential and the opportunity to connect good people with, with other good people and help, you know, make lifelong memories. Yeah. But this is, I mean, these are cool As John bid these visitors farewell and turns his focus back to the ranch, Land Trust continues its work, sharing his story with others that they may also be interested in spending time in one of Montana's hidden gems. You know, we have about a million acres on the platform today. Uh, predominantly today in Montana, Nebraska, Kansas, we're expanding to a handful of other states very soon. But um, you can go and see the, the types of properties and the families that have you know, partnered with us because uh, I say partner intentionally, we are business partners with our landowners. We don't make any money unless you're making money. So it doesn't cost anything to sign up with us. Uh, we are on the same side of the table as you. It's good to just meet other normal, hardworking people that, that want to come out and and get outside, having that camaraderie of, with each other, you know, and seeing that a father and son was, you know, was rewarding to get to see them have that experience together. Connecting people and building experiences. Start sharing your adventure at landtrust.com. Good morning, my name's Bill Spar. Uh, give you a quick background on myself. Just out of high school, I, I joined the U.S. Air Force for a little over eight years and bounced around to a bunch of different places. Uh, after that, I got out and went back to school, got my degree, and then I went into the corporate trading world for about seven and a half years. Um, didn't love that environment, wearing a suit and tie every day, as it turned out, wasn't really for me. Um, and a little over two years ago, I was very blessed that uh, One Montana offered me a chance to be entrusted to be the Master Hunter Program Manager. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today is One Montana and the Master Hunter Program. I'm very fortunate that I love my job. And because of that, sometimes 
I can ramble on about it a little more than I intend to, so I'm going to do my best to, to breeze through these slides for you today. So, if you've never heard of One Montana, our mission is to sustain a vibrant Montana by connecting rural and urban communities. And our program supports private land stewardship, maintaining agriculture and working lands, preserving cultural heritage, and we also engage in community efforts that help bring the urban, urban and rural communities together. And we do that through two primary programs, and that's our Common Ground Initiative and the Montana Way. Talking about our Common Ground Partnership, that all started when One Montana started surveying block management hunters, and then in 2010, they brought together a group of landowners, state agencies, and industry groups, nonprofits, outfitters, hunters, and other individuals to explore the issues that were affecting landowners in Montana. Um, that Common Ground Partnership has now grown into the Master Hunter Working Group and acts as an advisory council for me and the Master Hunter Program, and we're continuing to develop creative solutions to address issues pertaining to wildlife, sportsmen, and landowner challenges. So, if you've not heard of the Master Hunter Program, we kind of have three main tenets there as well. We're looking to create better hunters through completion of a rigor rigorous education curriculum, provide opportunities for sportsmen and landowners to interact, learn from each other, and discover the shared values that our communities have, and then also build ambassadors for the sport and tradition of hunting and voices to support private lands and wildlife conservation within the legislation. As I became more aware of the Master Hunter program and kind of what it was about, I thought that would be a really, really great way for me to get some practical, hands-on education and meet some people who are like-minded and you know develop a better network and make some new friends. And that's what it's been for me. It's it's been really great. And uh, you know, really one of the big motivators for me is that because I didn't grow up doing this with my family and knowing how much I love it now and how passionate I've been about it. I've got two little boys um, and I'd love to be able to give them the kind of experiences that I didn't get to have when I was younger and that I didn't really even know existed. So I'm one of the reasons why I'm, I'm trying to throw myself into this headlong is so that I can provide them the kind of opportunities that I didn't really get to have and, and hopefully they you know, enjoy it as much as I do someday. My name is Bill Spar. I'm the program manager for the Montana Master Hunter Program. I often get asked, what is the Master Hunter Program? It's an educational program for advanced hunter ethics, behaviors, and skills with three main goals, to help sportsmen and landowners improve their relationships, to help landowners in the state of Montana with wildlife management goals, and to help create an ambassador program for sportsmen to go out there and, and have the right behaviors on the landscape. It's also a community. It's a community of like-minded individuals who want to see the right behaviors, the right ethics, the right skill set on that landscape. So it's not just a class, it's, it's a community. So what can somebody expect coming into the Master Hunter program? Uh, I would say that they can expect a challenging program ahead of theirs. It's six days of classroom work, two days of field qualifications, a written final. It really tests their ability on a wide variety of topics and skills. We cover things like history of wildlife conservation, landowner relationships, uh, ethics. We go into a precision shooting course. as well as tracking and trailing, uh, land navigation. We really look at the, the base skill set that we're looking for in a master hunter. We try to expand on that and, and really test and, and push people to better themselves. To continue on, why do our hunters participate in the master hunter program every year? And for a lot of reasons, it's because they're lifelong learners. That's really the, the target demographic for the individuals that, we're look, that we bring into the program. They also come in to meet other like-minded hunters and to learn how to talk and work with landowners. A lot of hunters in Montana don't really understand the, the ranching and, and farming lifestyle, and this helps them get that, that understanding. And then it's also to help them improve the public perception of hunting. Here's a quick quote from one of our participants. Um, 
to further grow the connection between ethical hunters and landowners, growing mutual respect and understanding, repairing the historic poor behaviors, uh, developing hunters' understanding of issues facing private landowners and help bridging the gap between those two entities, and to build relationships between hunters and landowners and foster communication about how we can help each other. One of the key tenets that we do outside of the actual education program is we host a number of Master Hunter Service projects every year. These are tailored to each of our landowner partners to meet their needs. Um, some of the things that we've accomplished this year, and this is by no means a, 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 a long or a concise list, um, we've helped on branding projects, trail maintenance, weed removal, um, and installing and removing wildlife friendly fencing. By the end of the year, we'll have about 25 projects completed. Um, historically, um, I think I have the, I'll get to the slide later with, with the actual numbers of, of how many projects we've accomplished. But why do landowners participate and become formal partners of, of the program? And it's because it's a landowner driven program. Um, if you partner with Master Hunter Program, you know that the individuals are coming out or being vetted before they ever step on your property. You know that the, the profile that we outline is going to have specific rules for your property that you get to dictate. Um, we ensure that the coordination is done to your needs so it, we can be as involved or uninvolved as possible. If you want to talk to every hunter that you bring out, you have that opportunity. If you want us to set up the times and dates and never have to deal with anybody, we can handle that too. Um, it also helps make hunting more attractive to landowners as a wildlife management tool. We have very few properties that allow any kind of bull elk or buck deer harvest. Almost all of ours are geared toward, or well, all of ours are geared, geared toward wildlife management. So if you have cow elk, that's what we come out and try to help with. If, if we have too many white-tailed does, then that's, that's what the target species will end up being. And then it's also an opportunity for the landowners to tell their story, which is something that often goes overlooked in communities outside of ranching. To date, we have between 20 and 25 formal landowner partners. That changes, so that's why we have that range in there. Um, like I said, we're geared to meet your wildlife management goals, help with your hunt coordination needs. And then also something that we do a lot of is noxious weeds management. We do that through our curriculum, it's, it's required that they have to be able to identify a variety of noxious weeds. And then as part of the program, they have to be able to identify them, put them on their, on their GPS, and then share that pin with the landowner if they find vetinata or spotted knapweed or anything like that. Um, and then, as I said, because it's wildlife management, you know, the Preble Ranch south of Great Falls, they're one that, that has issues with some noxious weeds. We have areas of the ranch that we don't go into because we know that they're in there, but if we see those noxious weeds outside of those areas, we do mark one GPS, provide it to the landowner so that they know, so they can get people in there to start spraying. And then the MPG ranch, a different model. Um, they primarily use us to help with cow elk and white-tailed doe harvest. They don't, we still identify noxious weeds if we come across them on that property, but their, their main objective is to try to move the, those animals off of, off of their sections. To date, from 2018 to 2023, we've had about 370 graduates. So that's 18 classes since 2018. About 18, more than 18 percent are current current mentors or hunters education instructors. The average age is 45, with our oldest graduate being 81. And then over the last four years, the Master Hunter Program has participated in 63 on-ranch projects, collectively donating more than 1,600 hours of their time. Um, we also have two upcoming projects coming up this weekend, um, so that number will change. Um, graduates represent 55 cities and towns in Montana, and, as well as 24 counties, and we currently have about 375,000 acres enrolled through our 25 ranches. Um, I'm Laura Soderquist. I'm here with Impact Ag Partners. Um, Kateri invited me to speak today to share a little bit about our regenerative ranching practices and our focus on stacking natural capital projects on the ranch. I'll share a little bit about um, some of what we have going on. Um, 
I lead the supply chain and natural capital component of Impact Ag. Um, before joining the company, I taught at Montana State University for quite a few years with a focus in rangeland ecology and soil science. Um, I also did some um, ranching on the ground where I ran goats for several years, um, primarily on private land, so I did have some public land projects and I ran some pretty big herds of um, five to six hundred goats, so I finally like came to my senses and realized that goat management is a lot to manage. So um, I switched over to what I have going on today. So um, again, focusing in on regenerative ranching and natural capital. A little bit about um, Impact Ag Partners. They originated in Australia and now have this division here in the U.S. Um, what we do is we focus in on agricultural asset management. So in doing that, we take the current land base and look at how we can create more value in that land base so we can maximize returns for our investors. We create that value through land stewardship. Um, we look at building resilience for rural communities, for the ecosystem, in ways that we can address climate change, prepare for the reality of climate change impacts, and potentially through building soil health, landscape resiliency, reverse some of those impacts um, on more localized, a more localized level. Um, we believe that it's important to communicate with the consumer for many of us involved with regenerative ranching, we have a really cool, vibrant story to share. So we believe it's important to connect that story with our consumers and create a really hopeful future for beef production and um, bring to light why it's important to have this grass-fed, regenerative ranching approach to landscapes today. Um, and then the big thing, this is why I'm here today, is thinking about the natural capital component of ranching. There's a lot of ways that we can um, be profitable and still build up that ecological component of these systems that we're managing. So this piece here, well, maybe, this is what I'm focusing in on a little bit more today. Um, thinking about supply chain and natural capital, I'm out in the field on the Matador Ranch, south of Dillon. This is me here with a couple of supply chain partners. And this is a Brazilian postdoctoral student, uh, Paula DeMilo. Um, he has a super cool project on the ranch that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, so Matador Ranch is one of the assets that we manage here in Montana. It is the largest ranch in Montana with just about 419,000 acres under management. Uh, most of that is in rangeland, but we do have about 25,000 acres that are um, mostly pivot, irrigated, some sub-irrigated areas as well. Um, the enterprise focuses on large-scale ranching, so it's a grass-fed cattle production focus. Um, and again, really thinking about how to maximize ecological health while still bringing in that social and economic component to all that we do. Um, we currently have a stocking rate on the ranch of just over 15,000 animals. We're going to increase that number to about 17,000 um, as we find more, uh, more ways to bring in regenerative practices, high intensity grazing. We believe that we can increase those numbers while still maintaining the integrity of the triple bottom line, the social, economic, and ecological pieces. Um, and one of our natural capital projects that I've been working on pretty actively lately is this carbon project. We have four separate areas where we're focusing in on soil carbon. We have those areas baseline for soil data and now we're working towards registration of these projects. Um, and then another cool thing that we have happening on the ranch, I'm thinking about different ways to integrate natural capital is a methane reduction project. So if we're bringing in more cattle onto the ranch, we're also bringing in more methane emissions. So we want to find a way to bring those greenhouse gas emissions down. So we're doing that with this um, world's first in-pasture trial of, um, of seaweed for methane uh, reduction. So we have um, this trial going on with asparagopsis. This is a type of seaweed that has been shown to have the potential to reduce methane emissions in cattle when they consume this seaweed. 
Um, so the seaweed has compounds that, compounds that work within the ruminant system of the cattle themselves to reduce emissions. And so far, um, we're seeing that by adding asparagopsis to the diet of our cattle, we're reducing methane emissions by 60 to 80 percent. So this is the trio here. And I have a whole slide photo of this. So this is what the trio looks like. This is still happening on the ranch right now. We have 25 cattle that are in the trial. Some are in, are in a control, so they're not getting any seaweed. Others are uh, getting seaweed. So each cow in this trial has been fitted with a special tag. And right over here is this, these dispensers that, that dispense just three little pellets a day um, that, they, that have the seaweed. So um, this whole thing here, this is actually in partnership with uh, UC Davis. So they're the ones that have sent us Paulo, the postdoctoral student that is um, leading this project. So we have this trial out in the field and we have um, these devices up here are measuring the air constantly. So they're measuring nitrogen, oxygen, methane, everything that's currently happening in the air. And then there's these little chutes in here where the cattle can go in and they are fed pellets. The uh, control group just gets regular pellets. The cattle that are participating in the asparagopsis piece are getting pellets with asparagopsis. And each cow has a special ear tag, and, and that tag is um, programmed so they get three pellets per day. And this machine will chime if the cow goes by, it'll chime and tell them that they're due for their next pellet. And it's really cool, the cows get super excited about it. They'll walk by, they'll get their chime, and they'll go in to this feeder in here, which you guys can't quite see, and they'll put their mouths into this feeder, and this is measuring their respiration. So this is where we're getting the numbers to determine how much methane is coming out of these control animals versus these animals that are getting the seaweed, which is reducing their methane. And again, numbers are looking really positive for this, and roughly 60 to 80 percent reduction in methane for these guys. So super cool project. It's been really neat to, to see the success of this. <coughs> okay, so thinking about stacking, um, again, if we're going to add value to an already existing land base, we need to be creative. We need to bring in these regenerative ranching practices, but we don't just stop there. We think about how we can integrate all different aspects of uh, creativity into the, our toolbox that we're bringing onto this ranch. So we're stacking natural capital here um, with the carbon project that I already mentioned. Um, we're pretty diligent about this project. We've gone out, we've done baseline data, we've set up permanent monitoring transects so we can actively go in and check and see our, pro our progress and if we're not meeting the standards that we want to meet, we reevaluate our current approaches to see how those can be improved. Um, I mentioned this methane reduction project that I just highlighted really cool that this is the first uh, on pasture project like this and the outcomes are positive. So we hope that this can be scaled up and implemented out in the field and in ranches like you guys have today so it isn't just necessarily limited to the Matador Ranch. We'd like to see this uh, on, on a large scale. Uh, we also believe in uh, maximizing our premiums for the cattle we're producing. So we're working with two vertically integrated grass-fed beef brands to uh, obtain a premium for the products that we're producing there. Um, we are in 2024 going to hit the ground with a virtual fencing program. Um, this is in collaboration with uh, conservation and local agencies in the Centennial Valley. Um, if you're not familiar with the Centennial Valley, one, you should go there and check it out. It's just a gorgeous landscape, really large, intact landscape. It is difficult to integrate high intensity grazing in this landscape currently because we're limited with the fencing components. So we believe that this will be a really cool tool to bring in where we can uh, integrate more regenerative ranching, high intensity grazing approaches without having to invest a lot in permanent fencing infrastructure or have someone out there moving temporary fencing all the time. So we're bringing in virtual fencing to accomplish that goal there. Um, another cool thing we have going on is just in 2022, we started an elk hunt program with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. 
Um, we had, up until last year, we had about 2,500 elk coming out onto the ranch every fall and through the winter. And as you can imagine, that puts a lot of pressure on our winter range. Um, so we wanted to just see ways to disperse this herd. We didn't necessarily want them totally moved off the ranch, but having a concentrated herd of 2,500 elk had a lot of big impacts. So we partnered with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to have coordinated hunts. And to think about that community piece again, we reached out to local communities to see who needs um, uh, uh, more food security. We brought out um, youth for these hunts, so um, only the youth can harvest the, the trophy bowls. So the, there's certain elk designated for just those youth hunts. We also had a veteran hunt day um, to give people that opportunity as well. Um, another thing we're doing on the ranch for this capital, natural capital stacking is we're collaborating. So we're working with state agencies, local agencies, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to uh, promote habitat for threatened and endangered species. We have a pretty large reach of stream, which hosts Arctic grayling, which are um, uh, threatened. They're close to being listed. And so we're trying to find ways to be progressive on that ecological front to ensure the longevity of the species here. Um, I got ahead of myself a little bit. This photo here is from our carbon <coughs> project. So our carbon project I mentioned is four separate carbon project areas. One is in the rangeland in um, Centennial Valley, and then we have a couple pivot projects. And that's what this image is, for, is from here. Um, we went in and did some baseline data looking at current carbon levels on our pivots. By having this baseline data, we can begin to strategize and develop activity changes that are going to increase this carbon so we can capitalize on this opportunity um, of building soil carbon. And these are all natural outcomes of just regenerative ranching. So it isn't necessarily like something that's limited to like a large scale ranch like the Matador. This can come um, on any scale, just depending on the context, which is super cool. Okay, so let's look at the returns for this type of approach. It has super high social returns, really phenomenal ecological returns, and we're seeing those same returns on the economic front as well. So through management and monetization of our natural capital, we've been able to deliver returns of 8 to 12 percent. So we're doing a few different things here. One, we're looking at management. How can our management integrate more regenerative practices to increase that bottom line? Um, we're thinking about the soil carbon component. And then for the future, you think about capital growth premiums. So this goes back to the meat market. The world is beginning to recognize that regenerative ranching should be rewarded. So we're doing this through um, optimizing the markets where we're selling our beef. We're selling beef with a really cool story. Grass fed, no hormones, humanely raised. All of these things raise the premium value of the beef that we're selling. And, and in Montana as well, most of us are doing this type of ranching to some extent. So it's time that we have those monetary rewards and we deserve that. Um, we see the biodiversity component of natural capital maturing in the US. So we believe that we can um, gain more for the, the natural capital component with that as well. Um, I talked a little bit about our product premium. So we see um, with Impact Ag, with our regenerative ran ranching practices, and also those that we see across Montana, opportunities for co-benefits um, within this natural capital piece, within this social piece, to gain more access to monetization pathways um, and, and just to be able to participate and build in these natural capital markets. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you. Awesome. Great. I appreciate it when, uh, with the presentations from the start of today. Uh, we'll open it up to q and I have a few questions that I'll start with the presenters, and then please, you know, all the questions that you guys gathered throughout this time, please uh, raise your hands and we'll just go for each person. So, uh, Mark, just a, a question to start for you. I was kind of curious, looking at the, you know, I imagine a lot of the folks here are familiar with hunting programs and, and know that that can be 
do a pretty lean group for a lot of folks. What do you see as the next biggest thing? Is there something that's really been accelerating recently, whether it's ecotourism uh, or fishing or whatever else? What, what is really what comes behind hunting for you guys, and what are you seeing in growth there? Yeah, well, we started out uh, hunting just because it was an existing problem, right? Almost all uh, ranchers either had family or friends or, or folks that come out, and it was sort of a problem that they were already managing. What we're doing now, though, is looking to other activities and other sectors of, of folks. We just launched a partnership with the Keystone RD, and we started doing a survey a little bit. It turns out we're running between anywhere between one and four and one and five of our existing customer base is RV interested. Either they have RVs and they do, do RVs and things like that. And the reason why we started to look at this segment was if anybody is familiar with the segment, um, actually I'll do a quick show of chance. Who, who has an RV? Who goes who goes to campgrounds and stuff like that? Yeah. When's the last time you found a campground with an open slot? Right. Here in Montana, you have to go up on Wednesday or Thursday night, drop it, go back to work Thursday, Friday, and then go back for the weekend. Right. And so what we found is there's a large demand from this segment to have access to private ground. Ranches are a great way to do this. Um, they also want to do it in sort of uh, you know May, June, July. Uh, so it's out of phase with, with most of our ranching activities. It's out of phase with hunting, and this is a whole other segment that basically wants to you know, come out in their RV, bring their kids, bring their family, and not just have a camping experience, but also have a ranch experience. So we find that we have ranchers that are willing to um, introduce those guests to what is going on with the ranch, what, what ranch life is like, let them pet the calves, let them see what it means to move cattle, our highest reviews come from folks that get to sit down and have dinner with cowboys on Sundays. Like it's amazing the experience. Like and that's what Manchester is really all about. It's about the experience. But um, yeah, this next sort of segment of, of RVs and, and that sort of experience, it's sort of I'll call it like a camp ranch experience by by those folks. We see it. It may actually be as big as hunting and as valuable as hunting. Uh, and kind of very low impact to the, the ranch, things like that, very complimentary to a lot of the, uh, lot of the infrastructure that we already have. Fantastic. Awesome. I have a question. Yeah. So you said, I think Nick said you guys have about a million acres. Yeah. Um, so how much Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So, um, you know, land trust started very humbly, um, and it started to solve a very specific problem. Ultimately, it's about keeping the farm and ranch and the property, right? And so that first slide that I started off with, look at costs, look at profit, look at stacked enterprises, right? What has happened as we've grown our, our footprint, we're probably, I don't know, probably 1.3 million acres now, 1.4, something like that. What has happened is, uh, and if there's any ranchers in here that are on land trust, you know this, we develop a very strong relationship with our ranch partners. They call us when they have hay to sell, when they need hay, if they need processing capacity, if someone has processing capacity. This was never sort of in the blueprint, I would say, of the original sort of land trust model. It was just very simply, and add a profit stream to the farm and ranch. We are finding ourselves increasingly in the position to be both a matchmaker um, across our footprint, as well as potentially, um, you know, sort of some, I think some of the things that you alluded to, can we combine ranches? Can we combine forces? Row crop guys have been doing this forever, right? Co-op model and row crop is, is super common. Um, they use it for buying power, they use it for uh, elevators, they use it for hauling, they use it for a bunch of stuff. It's not as common in ranching. You see more consolidation, and you end up with giant ranches um, that kind of do this internally, but you don't end up with a lot of smaller ranches that get to work. There is an opportunity for it. We are, I would say, just scratching the surface with it, but there is definitely an opportunity. Uh, and this is for Laura. I was wondering if you feel that, you know, obviously given the scale of a place like Matador, are there any other projects you're doing 
do you think are only available because of the scale you guys have, or do you really see these being available to smaller landscapes? And the other question on top of that that I want to add is, how do you guys think about the blend of your public and private lands? Obviously, I know that you guys have quite a lot of, of both. Do you think about your products differently in a public landscape setting? And we'd love to just kind of hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, as far as the natural capital projects that we have going on, I think that those are scalable at any level. Um, it's important to um, be real about the context. The context of the Matador Ranch is very different than the context of maybe a 500 acre farm or ranch. Um, but it, it is not limiting. That context should never be limiting. You just have to manage within those realities. So I think it's um, any of these things that we're doing, the, the um, soil carbon projects, the, uh, the hunts, even the asparagopsis trial, maybe the, the trial piece itself might be difficult, but integrating um, that, that type of feed into a system is all totally doable. And I don't think that um, the size of a farm or ranch should be limited uh, to access any of these natural capital projects. And then, um, Ben, could you remind me of your second Just question? on the public versus private lands, how do you guys, do you think about your natural capital differently on public lands than you do on private lands? And how do you guys think about that blend? Um, we, we don't think about them too uh, differently. We do have a natural capital project that's going on um, both private and public lands. Um, we believe that we are stewards of the landscape, whether or not it's private or public lands. We're managing them on an equal level. There are certainly some limitations that come with raising leases, so we have to work within those parameters. Um, but that's where it's really important to bring in um, a collaborative type relationship with um, all agencies that are involved. And so there might be a little bit of flexibility on when we can move on or when we can move off. And we might um, be able to show the outcomes of uh, um, change if, if they are willing to be flexible with stocking rates. Um, season abuse, all those types of things. So we believe it's important to have um, the ability to be a little bit dynamic with how we're managing those landscapes. And again, to go back to the relationships, it's really important to have positive relationship with all stakeholders involved. Then we can all come to the table and determine how we can fit the needs of the ecosystem, that social piece, and then in the end, that the economic bottom line. Awesome. And last question on my side, and then we'll open it up to the, to the uh, crowd. So Bill, uh, I said, I'm curious, what are you guys looking for in a landowner? You kind of mentioned what you look for in the hunters, the experience, and what they're getting out of the program. And you kind of talked about some of the benefits of landowners. How do they go about signing up, and, and what are you looking for? Obviously, hopefully they have animals on the property, but what are the other things that you're looking out for? That's a good question. Um, we don't really have a, like a stereotypical landowner that we're looking for. Um, I would say some of the things that landowners that would be interested in signing up might want to do, might want to be able to do is share their story. Um, I think that one of the biggest issues facing, you know, sportsmen and landowner relationships right now is a lack of understanding. And what we find through our program is both sportsmen and landowners are both stewards of the land. And that's not something that we always consider. And understanding how much each of these user groups care about the animals on the landscape, care about the actual landscape itself, goes a long way. And being able to share the, the stories of these ranches, especially the multi-generational ranches. Um, we have non-traditional ranches that are partners with us that are doing research, that share their stories. Um, and then we try to make it beneficial both ways. So if they have projects around the ranch that they need help with. Um, I had that slide where we, we worked with branding. Um, not all of our ranches provide access. Sometimes it's access only for the people that come out and help with a project. That branding project that year, this year was a, a great example of that. We had four people come out and help brand and they get to hunt this fall. Um, but we've also done things like uh, put flagging on fences for sage, around sage grouse lecks so that they're not hitting the fences. Um, we, we just did a massive chicken butchery that I think this is our second year doing that. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things that we do, but as far as landowners that are looking to reach out and, and potentially become part of the program, um, you can go to our website, onemontana.org or mtmasterhunter.com. Um, there's links on the website to kind of guide my contact information, if you didn't get it off the slide, I can provide that to you. 
um, be more than happy to, to chat about it. But ultimately, yeah, it's it's about um, a landowner that has a short a story to sell or a story to tell, and allowing us to be kind of the catalyst for them to do that. Awesome. awesome. Are there questions from the crowd? Yes. So, do any of your organizations provide any additional liability insurance? I mean, you're talking about bringing outside people on your ranch doing all sorts of different recreational activities. Does that fall under the rancher's insurance, or do, do your agencies provide insurance that would cover that? Yeah, it's a good question. It's almost always the first question, too. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, let me let me cover because we we do this extensively probably it's, and it should my answer should cover some of these folks too uh, the first thing we started is at the state level there's about 34 states that actually have an agitators of statute specially designed to cover your liability for a four fee agitators so believe it or not and montana is one of those states so right off the bat you are covered at the state level statute against everything except like what the state defines as gross negligence and what gross negligence would be in terms of a farmer or a ranch if you're given a hay ride and you know there's only one lug nut on the wagon that's gross negligence like it has to be it has to be really extreme there's no there's no liability around anybody falling in a gopher hole or you know any of the, any of that kind of stuff that you would you would normally worry about getting sued on. growing up we used to have neighborhood kids hunt our farm without permission all the time. That was petrified of one of them falling out of a deer stand, breaking a leg, and us getting sued for it. I totally understand the question. So we start at the state level. The next thing we do is, as part of our transaction, and I'm sure the Master Hunter program is similar, the hunters agree to hold you harmless. So it's part of the legal agreement in terms of service right up front. There's a complete hold harmless and responsibility taken by the guest. Um, so as part of the, that's built into the legal agreement. The other thing we do as part of that digital transaction is we include whatever the language is in that state level agritourism statute as part of the transaction digitally so that they're given. We also provide you some states, Montana it's optional, but some states require that language to also be on a posted sign. We send you that signage as well. Montana it's optional. If you want it, we'll provide you the signage as well. We have all. We have dozens of these in the office from every state. Uh, the next thing we do is we ID verify every guest. The reason we do ID verification uh, is, is twofold. One, a guest on land trust is a wholly unique entity. What I mean by that is they can't go and create a new email, you know, elkkiller99 at gmail, and then create a new account and be a bad actor. Because we have their ID and their ID verified, it doesn't matter. Like we track them through their entire life cycle through the through the uh, platform. What that does is we provide both the landowner and the guest the ability to rate one another and their experience. And so, as landowners, you get to rate your experience with that guest. That rating sticks with them forever. So, right immediately everyone is on their best behavior because if they come out and they misrepresent either themselves or they misbehave in any way that rating is for life and they'll never get on another land trust property so this sort of balance has really done a lot of good for us in terms of weeding out any of the bad actors or some folks are like oh i don't want to give you my ID. Oh, that's fine you don't you won't be on land trust you know, there's public land you can go you know mess around with. so we we do that the next thing to do is then our insurance so we cover property damage for you the landowner the guest assumes liability and responsibility however if for some reason and we have the billing relationship and our credit card and everything however if they come out and they damage something they break something most ranchers always ask me if they shoot a bull it's never happened but that's always the question i get we will pay you back for the bull if that happened uh, or make sure you're compensated uh, the worst we've ever had happen in like four years of operation is somebody left some ruts uh, because it was muddy and they had, you know, the landowner asked them not to drive or park in a certain place and they did. And that's, that's the worst that has happened to date. We also do accident coverage for the guests and this is basically a way to insulate you and the guest. They are responsible, they're responsible for themselves, but if they do 
break a leg or something like that, we would step in in the, between you and them and cover any kind of accident up to ten or fifteen thousand dollars in minutes and something like that. We backstop all of that with a million dollar liability policy. That land trust carries that as a backstop. What I cannot do is name you as an individually insured entity on that backstop. And so what we what we do is we ask you to check with your agent and just make sure that your basic liability policy that you already have covers you for four fee activity. Once in a while, we'll run into somebody that has an exclusion for four fee activities. What we do, we've partnered with Farm Bureau, in this case, in those states where they have insurance. And you can add four fee coverage for about $200, $250. Um, and there's no reason to pick that up until you have bookings and, and want to have guests. We encourage you to do that, even if, even with the state level protection on liability, you know, we just consider it as layers and layers of protection. As you know, all of that, I can sue you. Like, there's nothing that stops me from doing that, whether I'm supposed to be on your property or not, right? Uh, and that's what we run into, but that's how land trust approaches it. I know some of that stuff will apply uh, both to the master plan. What exactly is going on there? Because it's, it's, the room is basically big fermentation vat. Methane's a byproduct of that fermentation. So either you're, you're and I don't know, either it's, it's giving off a different gas or it's lowering the efficiency. Yeah, that's a great question. So, eight, eight, sorry, 80% okay. seems like a hell of a number. Yeah, you know, it, it is. Um, so what's happening there is it's actually a bacteria in the rumen that's producing the methane. Um, so what the when the cattle ingest this asparagopsis seaweed, it is um, kind of diffusing the rate at which this bacteria produces this methane. So it, it's kind of buffering that. It offers a buffer. Um, and so that's really what we're targeting is this bacteria in the rumen. Um, and so we're seeing reduction rates of 60 to 80 percent. They've actually been even higher, but, but the average range has been right around 60 to 80 percent. And that, that has been in this trial where, we're, again, we're measuring the respiration of the cattle that are, are consuming the seaweed in comparison to cattle that are not. Um, so I, I would say that um, probably 70 percent is a conservative estimate with this range of 60 to 80 percent, sometimes higher. So what, I mean, if it's buffering a certain bacteria, okay, but the, the bacteria is breaking something down to make it digestible, but it gives up methane. So what's it doing instead? Um, we're not seeing any negative effects right now of um, this, like, by buffering this bacteria that it has any effects, uh, negative effects on the rumen system or the digestive process. This is just a bacteria, like, in this, this whole suite of biota that's within the rumen system. There's one particular species that has a higher rate of this uh, of methane production. And so it's not, um, it doesn't have any um, big impacts on the overall biotic community within the rumen. It's, it's just tampering this particular bacteria. And like in comparison to uh, bison, like the native rumens on this landscape, um, th this bacteria is, is not present at the same levels in um, um, native ungulates that it is in cattle. So we, we see them like still being able to process and digest everything. Um, it's just mitigating some of the effects of this yeah. particular um, bacterial species. And, and one thing that we'll touch on in the next session, we talk a little bit about the carbon markets, but methane, there is actually a mechanism by which they convert that into units for carbon. So this is starting to be uh, entering the marketplace. There's a number of companies right now that are working on those being official protocols. They have to be an approved thing, and so they have to do the research like they do on these ranches. There's a number of companies, and, and we're happy if you want to talk with somebody who's super scientific on this, but we have partners, Alga, Sombroja, there's a number of companies that have uh, you know, been advancing research on a number of those uh, topics, and uh, again, they are seeing pretty remarkably high numbers. I know one of the, the kind of two topics that people are focused on right now is, is weight gain the same rate, or do you have to keep the cow longer to reach the same weight, because that would have implications there, and then the other part is, does the cow's stomach chemistry adjust over time? So do you see that result for one year, but if the cow's there for three years, does its stomach start to readjust 
and then produce methane. I know that there's a number of longitudinal studies, and so these things are all being investigated, but they've been, the research has now been going on for long enough that they're getting pretty sharp, and we expect probably in 2024 for the first major protocols to issue credits based on these. So it's something that a lot of people are keeping an eye on. Thanks for adding that. And I'll also include that um, the, the seaweed trial, had, this sort of thing has happened in a feedlot setting before. So it's not like we're reinventing the wheel or doing something like totally outside the box with the Matador Ranch with this trial. What is different is that it's an on pasture type trial versus a feedlot control setting. Great, other questions? Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.